delighted and I'm grateful to have my colleague Sarah Schoenfeld joining us for a session that's going to be all about mapping segregation and just what that initiative has meant for DC history world and for access to this chapter in DC's history for the public. We have Sarah and her colleagues at Prologue DC to thank for that. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Or I can you? hear you so you I hear me. that means the folks okay. can hear you. And I also can see you. Great. What neighborhood do you live in in Washington? Uh, I live in um, what, what the historical subdivision name of where I live is Brightwood Park, uh, which is now sort of known as like Greater Petworth um, around just south of Missouri Avenue. Right. Uh, near North Capitol Street off of New Hampshire Avenue. So you're close, you're, you actually are maybe by coincidence close to the um, study area of a lot of mapping segregation. First, tell me though, how you and your colleagues came to found Prologue DC and what is Prologue DC? Um, okay, so Prologue DC is essentially myself and Mara Tchaikovsky. Um, another, both, another DC area another, historian. Yeah, historian that, that people may, may know her well from her work around town. We were both uh, historians for the DC Neighborhood Heritage Trails for Cultural Tourism DC. Um, we worked on a lot of those trails together uh, for many years. Um, and that program sort of uh, ended, um, or at least ended well, temporarily. Yeah. I mean, there is actually another heritage trail coming online soon, I think, um, after many, many years. But so in 2014, we, um, we decided we wanted to continue doing that kind of work uh, on our own. So we, we formed Prologue DC at that time. And, that, and at the same time, we started working on mapping segregation uh, with our colleague, Brian Kraft, uh, who had also been a, a heritage trail historian for Columbia Heights, um, was very interested in pursuing GIS mapping. All of us had kind of sort of come into this issue of racially restrictive covenants um, in our work on uh, DC neighborhood history. And we were all interested in learning um, more about what impact they may have had. And how long um, did you work on, I guess folks, we should let folks know that mapping segregation is this initiative, it's this work, but it also exists out in the world as a website, as a really rich website that people can access. Um, how long did it take you to get to the point where you had content and mapping available to create a website? Uh, gosh, um, not all that long. Um, because what we did was we focused our work, uh, we, well, and what you're gonna see today is we focused our work uh, on one neighborhood to begin with, um, so that we were able to build out a story online, uh, a story map um, about, uh, the impact of covenants on one neighborhood in DC. Um, so what, by being able, by focusing our research in one place, we could sort of show, um, you know, tell a significant story. Um, so we did that, I think, in, we started researching covenants in January of 2014. Um, I think that fall, we, we, we all together did a presentation at the DC History Conference about our findings thus far, and then it was the following year at some point that we, um, that we built a story map, that, that Brian built our first story map for us. Um, and that's um, the work that you're gonna be seeing, or I'm gonna be talking about today, about the legal right. challenges to covenants in Bloomingdale. Right, so Bloomingdale <laughs> yeah. became, and you worked on the um, Heritage Trail, the series of signs that winds through the Bloomingdale neighborhood um, as well. That's, that's right probably a good point to segue from me sharing my screen for our welcome slide to you sharing your screen for your presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. And you can start sharing. Here we go. 
Here it comes. All right. Uh, okay. Oops. Okay. So, um, so as we were just talking about, we, um, Mara and I both worked on this um, Little Wright Park Bloomingdale Heritage Trail together, um, and uh, it was it was through that work and also work on other neighborhood heritage trails that that we began learning about this issue. Um, and specifically um, the fact that Bloomingdale sort of was a national epicenter of legal challenges to racially restrictive deed covenants. A national um, one. So this yeah, is a national this is very yeah. much a DC story, but it also like so many things with our city has a national implication. Right. Um, so um, I, uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how much to tell you now versus getting right into it. Um, so the, so I guess I should say that this is, um, this presentation is sort of based on a mashup of different resources that are available. Um, so we've got the website mappingsegregationdc.org. Um, there's the the Droit Park Bloomingdale Heritage Trail, which I would definitely um, uh, encourage people to explore. You can even yeah. do that right now on your own. Um, uh, and then there's a, um, a self-guided walking tour um, that, that I'll show you a little bit of today. Um, and so the, the website itself features um, much more detail than what I can show you today, but um, uh, mapped data of, of where racial covenants, um, and I'll talk about what those were, but these are, um, you know, legally binding um, agreements and deeds for, for housing that barred, um, primarily, or always barred, if they barred certain groups from, from buying or renting houses, uh, and, and, and those groups always included African Americans, they sometimes included other groups. Um, such as, as Jewish people most commonly in this area. Um, uh, <clears throat> so our website includes, uh, you'll see, you know, images of what those deeds look like, um, census date, mapped census data, um, and uh, mapped uh, covenants for other parts of the city, not just Bloomingdale, um, historic photos, um, historic maps, news clippings, um, and lots of other primary documents that we've collected over the course of the, the past several years um, working on this project. Um, and let me see what my next slide is. This person is okay. standing in the Bloomingdale, the photo we have now, this person is standing in the Bloomingdale neighborhood. And here is... Which is that? Sorry, let me... Yeah, so right. So this photo is um, Bloomingdale, 136 Adams Street Northwest. Um, I think it comes up again later, and I'll talk about the context for this, this auction that took place in 1941 for a house that had had a racial covenant on it um, uh, for, you know, since it was built. Um, so again, uh, today's talk is going to draw from a number of different resources. Um, uh, including actually, so this is the self-guided walking tour that I mentioned. Um, and I kind of wanted to design today's talk like an actual walking tour. Um, so I, I, I sort of did that at least for the first half or so. Um, to Very try to like, I yeah, did to, not object. <laughs> to try to like, you know, take you through where we would, we'd actually start at the bottom of Bloomingdale and walk up north. Um, but in this case, we won't have to walk back down, which is um, we, we do when we're actually walking. Um, so uh, I, it's going to draw somewhat from this, this walking tour and also from uh, the, a historic district nomination um, that we wrote for Bloomingdale, um, in part based on this history around the legal challenges to racially restrictive covenants. It's, it was such a, a nationally important story. Um, this became an integral part of the our nomination, which was successful um, to make right. Bloomingdale a, a, a designated historic district. Um, and but what I'm also, books, yeah, I want to mention too, looking at this slide, you all have your website, Mapping Segregation DC. This, DC Historic Sites, this is a resource folks should know about 
This is a creation, I believe, of the DC Preservation League, right? Yes. And yeah. this is actually, this is a website and this is an app that you can download um, and has great information about buildings throughout uh, Washington, DC. You can just click and find a history of a building. It's divided into arranged by neighborhood. And then it's so great, it includes this aspect of Bloomingdale, this particular uh, seeing Bloomingdale through the lens of the covenants. Yeah. So this is one of um, a number of different tours you can access um, through this app. And if you look at the, the logo here, DC Historic Sites, that's an easy way to recognize it if you search yep. here. Because if you type in DC Historic Sites into your app, you're going to see like, gonna, a lot of stuff, but it's the one that looks it. like this. Yep. Um, so um, it's, we also have a tour that uh, we worked on that's a um, African-American civil rights sites um, all over the city. It's, it's 101 sites. Um, uh, that's, that's in there. Uh, there's, there's a number of different tours of the DC Preservation League is designed. And then there's just sites. So if you're curious, if you're yep. around, you know, in the city looking at, a, at, a, at a, an old building and wondering what it might be and it might be designated as a landmark, it's going to be in here. Um, so it's a great resource. Um, and just to orient you, so uh, blooming. So these um, these are all the sites on on the on the self guided tour, uh, beginning at the southernmost end of Bloomingdale here um, at Florida and first or first in R. This is R Street. Um, this is the Ledroit Park neighborhood over here, which I'm going to be talking a little bit about. So Howard University is just up here at the um, the, the northern end of that. Uh, Florida Avenue uh, is the, the northernmost boundary of, of the old city of Washington, D.C., so, um, so prior to its cons consolidation with, with Washington County, um, this was sort of all very, very rural um, up until close to the turn of the, the, the 20th century, really. Um, and, and you'll see that from, from one of the pictures I'm going to show you of what, what this area looked like. Uh, when Bloomingdale was first developed um, around that time. So around between 1890 and 1910 is when Bloomingdale was developed. <clears throat> um, this is just sort of like an iconic image of what Bloomingdale looks like from North Capitol Street. So if you're not familiar with the neighborhood, um, you may have driven right by it many, many times. Um, right. um, it's, you know, these, these turrets that you see, um, it's really striking sort of for how filled in it, it what, how rapidly it was developed um, with residential housing. So it didn't leave um, opening for sort of for later infill um, for the most part. You've got these very long rows of, um, of, of quite substantial, um, you know, Victorian style, but a range of, of styles of row houses. Um, <clears throat> Um, I just want to start with um, talking about LaDroit Park a little bit, which is right next door, I, as I showed you. Um, uh, LaDroit Park was developed as a, as a racially and economically exclusive neighborhood, um, not with the use of racially restrictive covenants, but it actually had a, a, an actual fence around it. Um, that you <laughs> a can barrier, <laughs> a border <laughs> wall, as it were. Right. So you can actually see that um, in this this old map of LaDroit Park. This is um, Florida Avenue. Um, and that's, and actually, it, 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 I think the fence um, carves out this church uh, and comes back here along what, what is now um, Elm Street. Uh, <clears throat> so this was sort of the, this was the formal front, front of the neighborhood where there was actually a gate right here and then there was another one um, here, uh, <clears throat> where there's a replica gate today, right, at, uh, mm -hmm. right across from the Howard Theater. Right. Uh, this church actually became, because Carolyn asked me about this yesterday, and, um, and so I, I looked into this and realized, oh, this is the church that was actually purchased by the, so this was a white congregation. I don't know which one, but it was purchased by the Florida Avenue Baptist Church, a black congregation uh, uh, in 1912 or 1913, something like that. Um, and that congregation was, uh, the founding pastor was the grandfather um, of the, 
uh, of Billy Taylor, who's renowned jazz musician, jazz educator. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Florida Avenue Baptist Church bought that, that building um, and then later replaced it with, with the building that's there now, um, as I understand, in the, in the early 1960s. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so the Droid Park had this fence around it, meaning, and that was um, in part because of who lived around um, this area already. Um, there's a historic black community north of LaDroit Park around Howard University had been established in 1867. Um, in fact, it was a trustee of Howard University, a white trustee that was one of the, the people involved in developing LaDroit Park and had access to that land um, to be able to purchase that land. Um, Howard University was, there was an area around it that had been um, uh, Civil War Fort, um, Fort Campbell, uh, where African Americans had settled during the Civil War and, and remained. Uh, so there was a, a, a historic black community known as Howard Town um, in that area by the time that, you know, before LaDroit Park was developed. Um, African Americans also lived south of Florida Avenue, um, uh, you know, the Shaw area mm -hmm. um, at that time. So. Um, so the fence actually, this was a solid board fence at the back. There, were no, there was no entrance here. So you actually had to walk, you literally had to walk around the neighborhood to get yeah. to your job downtown. Yeah. Um, you couldn't go through it. And, you, and then you know, only residents, I think, or visit, you know, approved visitors, presumably, could then access the formal gates in the front. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way of um, restricting access to real estate yeah <laughs> that is one way um okay so bloomingdale on the other hand so bloomingdale began to develop um just east of ladroit park so again here's ladroit park uh in the late 1890s um and here in bloomingdale coven racial covenants were used uh to, to were they used from the outset they were used from the outset um and I'm going to talk about, uh, um, they didn't necessarily cover the entire neighborhood from the outset. Um, so I'm going to talk about why we have these different colors here. Um, because these red ones actually weren't there from the outset. Um, although I should say that many more, so all the, the uh, lots marked in blue um, are lots uh, where, that were sold with covenants in the deeds. Um, uh, and I'll show you what one looked like, um, barring the, the buyer of the property from, from selling or renting or, or otherwise conveying their property to, to African Americans. Um, these, the neighborhood, as I said, was built like between 1890 and 1910, most of it. And um, all of those, de those deeds from that period uh, are, are, are really sort of cumbersome to research because they have not been digitized and they're in books just organized by date. Um, with where, all, where, do they, where are they held? Where did they're you... held at the DC archives. Um, um, yeah. And they're in these massive like 500 page volumes that record every single transaction um, taken by the recorder of deeds uh, um, by date, so for the whole city. So you can use an index to like, you know, focus in on, on certain um, transactions, certain areas, you know, if you know your lot and square number that, you're, that you wanna know about. And that's what we did initially. Um, but that is to say that there are probably many more lots that should be colored blue that had deed covenants that we haven't yet identified um, as having had them when they were first developed um, because that, that research is so slow going. Um, and I had, and once we sort of figured out that the rest of the neighborhood had been fully restricted um, later on, we kind of set that that priority aside. Um, uh, and and one day we hope that those deeds will be digitized and we'll be able right. to to make this do this research <clears throat> much more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yes, yeah, so deed covenants were used. Um, by the developers, and not all of them, but, but many of the developers um, 
uh, in Bloomingdale uh, when they first built the houses, when they first sold the lots. Um, and in some cases, they may have been used mm, by the, you know, the, the people that own the land before they, you know, the land itself may have been restricted yeah. um, mm -hmm. before the building. Um, Okay, so, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about Bloomingdale and like Bloomingdale's development history before I get into the covenants more. Um, so, uh, Bloomingdale was, you know, this was a rural area north of the old boundary of Florida Avenue, um, sort of occupied very sparsely by um, uh, a, a number of different white landowners. Um, who had sort of these large estates and and um, you know, orchards and maybe animals and a um, lot of space. So one of them is is was named Emily Beale. She lived right here. Um, so thank you to I think Brian Kraft overlaid this historic based map on a street map so that we could see um, exactly where her estate lines oh, up with pretty. today's streets. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, um, these people all sort of were, the, the land here was becoming more valuable, I should say, like around, you know, the 1880s, as, as some of these people were dying off and, 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 their, and their heirs um, were not necessarily, were, you know, started selling off the land for development at that time. Um, but I'm going to, before I get to that, to talk about Emily Beale. Um, a little bit more on some of the other people, some of the people that lived here, many of the people that lived here were enslaved. Um, they were the property of the, of the white landowners. So this um, is just, a, this is a list of all of the enslaved people um, uh, living on Emily Beale's property um, at the time of uh, the DC Compensated Emancipation Act in 1862. Okay, yeah. Um, so these and explain to yeah. folks what that is in case they're not familiar with that. Yeah, so everyone knows about the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. but so um, slavery ended in D.C. on April sixteenth, eighteen sixty-two, uh, um, and here the owners of enslaved people were actually compensated for their for their property okay so enslaved people were not compensated for their labor but the owners were compensated up to $300 per person um, uh, provided they submit uh, this petition uh, to congress uh, describing those people and attesting to their value um, so these are, are um, you know these records which are, are available online um, are really sort of an interesting, I mean, you know, they're obviously very one-sided, um, but they're, they're an interesting, you know, um, uh, set of records to have about, about these people that were living here at this time. Um, and so these, this just for example, are just the people that were living with Emily Beale at this time. Um, Um, okay, so as I was saying, as as um, as Emily Beale died in the, in 1889, um, other landowners um, who had passed on their land to their children at this time, um, that land was then being sold off for development. So these are a number. These are like the the various subdivisions um, that were created around that time, um, that now all you know comprise Bloomingdale. Um, which is named, so Bloomingdale is actually named for Emily Beale's estate. Um, and originally was just down here. Um, so Emily Beale left her land to her son, George Beale, and her other children. George Beale was the, the, the one that, that went on to um, develop in this neighborhood. <clears throat> Um, and part of why the land was becoming valuable at this time is streetcar lines were being extended um, beyond the city's old boundary at Florida Avenue. So this is Florida Avenue. Um, this is the seventh street line. So in 1888, it was extended all the way up Georgia Avenue, all the way to uh, Brightwood. Um, 
This is the, the Eckington and Soldier's Home line. Um, and this, this one, this new little extension up to T Street um, was, when was that? I have in my notes, when it was finished in 1890, it extended up to T Street. So this is right when, so this sort of corresponds with Bloomingdale's development. Okay, so this is actually not, you know, this is pretty close to, to Bloomingdale. Um, as is this 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 line here, mm -hmm. um, and I and and these the people that were building the streetcar lines. I mean, these are privately developed. Um, in many cases, were the same people that were developing these new subdivisions. Okay, so you have like George Truesdell is the developer of Eckington. Um, you know, he is also the he's also the the person that is behind the construction the extension of this Eckington and Soldiers Home streetcar line and for whom an elementary school right. is now named. Um, so this, um, just to sort of continue to orient you, but also because I think this is a really interesting map, um, and it says something about Bloomingdale. Bloomingdale became the first um, here um, subdivision to be developed uh, in keeping with the L'Enfant plan, the grid, oh, yeah. okay? <laughs> yep. And um, this is because, although the development sort of began a little bit before this was called the Highway, the I Highway Act of 1893, which required that, um, it was known that that was gonna be required. And in fact, this 1887 map um, uh, proposed getting rid of the streets that had already been cut through the Detroit Park. Uh, because they were out of alignment. Right. Um, so this is Second Street. Uh, this this is sort of this is the border between Ledroit Park, and Bloomingdale, um, Second Street, First Street, North Capitol Street. Um, and and I should say that they were set off on purpose. Like Ledroit Park was built to be separate, you know, in, in a sense. Um, and so that. Um, uh, but then it also it, it it also had to do with you know where the waterways were too. So I think it was right along. Um, there was also a creek coming in right here. So uh, at any rate, um, Bloomingdale becomes the first subdivision to be developed in line with the, the Lompoc plan um, in, the, in that grid. Okay. So, and this is where we would start our walking tour, um, at the southern end of Bloomingdale, looking north along First Street. So we're at First and R. If you're familiar with the area at all, Big Bear Cafe yeah, would be say, yeah, right that's here landmark, right? on your left. Oops. Uh, yeah, so right here on your left. Um, and then, yeah, there's like a little triangle park behind you where Florida Avenue is right there. Um, and then this is looking north along that first block, um, that southernmost block of First Street. And this is what it looked like in 1888 uh, when, the, when the neighborhood was first being developed, looking north um, along what was becoming first the, the sewer under First Street. And, and that's, can, a, that's a rural setting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is how rapidly it, it gets developed, um, at, you know, starting at the bottom end of the neighborhood. Um, here again is Florida Avenue. Here's First Street, where we just were, looking up, First and R. Um, so all of these, um, all of these lots colored pink represent brick row houses that had been built by 1903. So that is, that's, like it feels like that's half filled in already. Yeah, well, this is only the bottom part of the neighborhood still, okay. um, but it all goes pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but you're saying this area is half filled in already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah at least. Um, and these are some of those um, houses along that first block, that bottom, that southernmost block. This is an old picture of the Big Bear Cafe. Um, this is, so this row um, along, so it's, it's actually the end, 
it's a big bear is at the end, um, this, the southern end of this row um, along the east side of First Street. Um, and these were all developed by George Beale. Uh, and they were, you know, and as were um, these houses on our, on that unit block of R Street uh, between North Capitol and First. And these look like nicely built um, homes that are going to be affordable by middle class folks. Yeah, they're quite substantial, actually. I mean, they're really they sort of like they exhibit a relative confidence in the in the real estate market in the, hmm. in the neighborhood. Um, you can raise a family in yeah. these houses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Here's more of them. And you can see, and they're quite um, sort of have kind of exuberant style to them. I mean, yeah. again, they're they really they're not they're not particularly modest houses. They're not tentative in there. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, okay, and then the other part of of Bloomingdale that gets developed quite early is the is actually the northernmost end of the neighborhood. Um, this, this, this is First Street. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so this is now Adams Street. This was called Albany Street. This is now Adams. This is now uh, Bryant, yeah. Bryant Street. And this is now Channing Street. So we're sticking with the alphabet, but we've got different names now. Um, w, V, U. Um, this is more in Barber's edition. You may remember from that subdivision map, Dobbins edition. So these, these, they're they're filling in up at the northernmost end of the neighborhood, um, along First Street on which would, which is what would become Bloomingdale's premier architectural corridor. Um, and it would also become the it's the racial barrier, um, as you, as I'll show you. Um, remember, Ledroit Park is, is over, um, just. Uh, west of, of Second Street here. Here's Second. Um, and these are these are some of those houses uh, being developed up on the northern end of, of First they're Street. They're beautiful. And yeah. you're right, they're large. Yeah. They're yeah. wide. Yeah. Uh, the developer is Ray Middaw. Uh, he's one, he's a uh, one of the very first developers in the neighborhood um, was also developing on the on the bottom, the southernmost end, uh, and then he formed a, a partnership um, with um, with uh, Shannon. I can't remember his first name. Um, so Mid on Shannon, um, they were, and then and so they developed a lot of, of Bloomingdale. Um, they used racial covenants in, in all of their houses and. Um, and they were the predecessor to a company called Shannon and Lux, mm -hmm. um, which was still, a, you know, it's not still around now, but was still around when I was growing up in DC, mm -hmm. like in the yep. 80s. Um, yep. So these are some of those houses close up. You can see they really have this very um, ornate, um, these ornate carvings um, around the doorways. So they're highly desirable. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're well located. They're on the streetcar line, um, not too far from downtown if you're going to commute. What if you, if you work at Howard? It would be certainly appealing neighborhood yeah. to try to live in. And if you had a family, mm -hmm. you could, you could, your family could just, you wouldn't maybe outgrow these houses necessarily. So this is one of the advertisements uh, Mida and Shannon placed in the paper for their houses being developed up on the, uh, the northern end of First Street. This is when only just one side of the street had been built up yet. Um, they, they promoted as the highest elevation within the lettered streets of the Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually, before we get to those, I wanted to just mention that I guess I had, I had an ad, but I took it out. Um, that the other thing they were promoting was the proximity to McMillan Park, which was just being built at this time. Um, the reservoir was there, but there was a, there's this park um, that was being developed in conjunction with the industrial features of the reservoir itself. Uh, and it was um, advertised as, as, you know, going, as, um, 
see if I have it in my notes. It's one of your amenities you would get. Yeah. We call yeah. it an urban amenity. Yeah. Today you'd um, say, well, you can have, we'll have outdoor yoga class there. We'll have happy hour. And in the summer, we'll show films on the green. Right, exactly. And they did. They had concerts there. You want to live here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is what it looked like. Um, there was the, the McMillan Fountain. This, these steps rose up from First Street, uh, just north of Channing. Um, this was Howard University's campus over here. So this was, um, and before the, you know, this was sort of an, almost like an extension to, to Howard's campus. Um, and it was open to all, um, McMillan Park. Um, it wasn't, you know, wasn't a segregated area. Um, but it was certainly advertised as an amenity for, for what was also advertised to be a white neighborhood. Um, and there was a segregated playground, the Bloomingdale Playground, at its southernmost end. <clears throat> This is um, looking, I think, yeah, looking north from First and Channing Street, yeah. So you can see there were walking paths around um, the, the sand silos. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I didn't say that Frederick Law Olmsted's firm designed this park. Yeah. Um, right. in, in, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, so then the other um, you know feature of all of Midon Shannon's how um, you know houses is that they're going to be restricted to to whites only, um, and this is um, the uh, this is a one of the deeds um, that they used early on um, when they were still handwritten, 1902. Um, and it says that said lot shall never be rented, leased, sold, transferred, or conveyed unto any Negro or colored person under a penalty of $2,000, um, which shall be a lien against said lot. Okay, so this is very typical um, language. It was in the deeds at the time. Would, I don't need to put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. Would colored person also apply to someone of Asian ancestry, Asian descent? Um... Because there were Asian Americans living in the D.C. area in their own enclaves, but yeah, I wonder. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, certainly uh, Chinese were the subject of some of the earliest uh, used covenants in, on the, in California um, and listed specifically. Um, um, I never have seen them listed here. Uh, the, well, I've seen Mongolians listed. Mm -hmm. um, in a covenant here in DC. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there could be a case made b both ways probably. I, I, I don't know um, because I don't know of any cases where, a, a, actually there is one case where one of the members of the couple was of Japanese descent, I believe, and one was African-American um, or, you know, biracial or something like this. So, uh, but I, I can't tell you the details of that right now because I can't remember it. Um, did I? Oh yeah. So we've got, sorry. I'm going, I, I uh, am clicking. <laughs> I'm trying to get back to where are we there. Okay. I have to just use my arrows. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so that was a mid on Shannon Covenant. Harry Wardman was another prominent developer in this neighborhood. Um, he developed these one, these houses right here. Um, his former architect, Louis Bruninger, built these ones along V Street. Um, Bruninger probably also uses used covenants, but we again we haven't we haven't mapped them yet. So these ones do show up on our, our map, um, these Wardman houses as having had covenants, um, as do all of these uh, on the unit block of Channing Street. So Channing is the northernmost block of Bloomingdale. Um, all of these Wardman houses had racial covenants in the deeds when they were first sold. And here they are, right here. So everything in blue. Right. White only. Right. Yeah. Um, 
So this case in 1907 uh, is the first that we, um, the first case we found in DC of white residents threatening to take a black home buyer to court um, to enforce a racial covenant. Meaning a black family had moved into that house. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they had even fully moved in yet, but they had purchased They'd the purchase. house. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it was a um, civil engineer named Samuel DeSales Smith and his wife, who I believe was a teacher. Um, they had purchased the house uh, and then were um, um, coerced into um, canceling the sale and a white buyer was found. Um, so the, the case didn't actually go to court. Um, and was that because of um, a group resistance, like a, a citizens association? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. so this, um, uh, um, the White Citizens Association organized, um, it was then I think called the North Capital Citizens Association, um, to and, and they did organize to actually bring a legal case, um, but then it didn't, um, uh, you know, they signed, they committed to, to funding a case. Um, okay. and, and one of the people that, that committed to funding the case was Samuel Gompers, well. okay, the um, American Federation of Labor's founder and, and uh, Samuel Gompers, um, who lived on the, the next block south along First Street. Do we know what happened to the Smiths, where they ended up living? Yeah, they ended up, they show up in the 1910 census as uh, living on Gerard Street in Columbia Heights. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe the 1200 block. Being that 13th Street was also a racial barrier in Columbia Heights. <laughs> where covenants were also widely used. Um, so the next earliest cases that we know about were in the 1920s um, at the southern, uh, in the southernmost blocks of the neighborhood. Um, and this is one of those cases, um, Tory v. Wolfs. Um, this involved a house that was uh, built by Midon Shannon in 1904. Um, and a deed was placed in the covenant, at, or, or, or a covenant was placed in the deed at that time. Um, uh, the Tories, um, were wanted to sell their house um actually did sell their house uh, i can't remember exactly the the chronology of it but they were selling their house to african-americans they they had um i think attempted to find a white buyer they had attempted to you know they had you know but they they were ready to move out of the neighborhood they wanted to sell their house um to um to a black couple uh, but the covenant was upheld in this case, the neighbors. Oh, so they were, they were amenable to yeah. it. They were amenable to an African-American couple purchasing their home. Yeah, yeah. But they were prevented um, from In part that. because um, at this point, you know, this neighborhood was actually quite desirable to, there were very few, weren't very many places where, uh, you know, middle-class sort of nice houses, uh, middle-class neighborhoods where African-Americans could move to at all. Um, and there was a lot of um, interest in this neighborhood. Um, and they were they were paying a lot more to you know they charge a lot more um, to mm -hmm. African American buyers um, because of the housing scarcity that they faced. Um, so the covenant was upheld, um, and the case this case actually set a precedent um, in the district for upholding um, these covenants um, inserted um, into the deeds by developers regardless of that $2,000 penalty clause. So the, the Tories actually said that they'd be willing to pay the $2,000. Wow. Uh, but that didn't matter. Wow. Um, yeah, so then you, you see that, penalty, that clause goes away. Um, um, so this is a letter that I found, uh, I think in the NAACP papers, um, printed in the North Capital Citizen. So this is the, the newspaper of the White Citizens Association um, reprinted here. This is a letter that was sent to another black buyer um, next door to the tour. So that house um, that I just showed you, that, that was 40 Randolph Street. Um, so here next door, another um, African-American man uh, purchased um, 38 Randolph Street um, and, and then um, proceeded, to, proceeded to be threatened by the Citizens Association into um, 
into not, you know, into giving it up. Um, in, so in print, this person is being threatened in the newspaper, in the citizen's newspaper. Well, this is the, it's like reprinted here. It was actually sent to him, I guess. And I think he must have um, been employed at um, Virginia Union College. Um, because, and, and then he was actually going to be renting it to another black couple. That's my understanding from, from reading this. Um, so it informs him, it informs him of the covenant that's on the house in case he didn't know about it and states that quote, your premises are the only ones now occupied in this particular block by a Negro family. Um, and it, and it says that the, the, the citizens association is, is prepared to take legal action. He would have known about the covenant, right? Uh, presumably, not. yeah. But the thing is, they're not always upheld, um, okay. especially in these areas where there's a, um, they're close to where African Americans are already living. Um, uh, so there's, you know, uh, yeah, he, he presumably knew about it. Um, so, so he's taking a chance that maybe yeah. he could prevail. Right. Um, the letter concludes, I hope you will believe me when I say that we have no animosity towards you or any other Negroes. Um, I wish it were possible to solve this perplexing question of property ownership amicably. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing that comes up. I've seen it in another mem memo that was given to black homeowners um, who were threatened um, by the White Citizens Association. This is nothing to do with you or black people. It's about the value of our property and you're going, your presence is going to devalue it essentially. Um, Uh, so this, so what happened now, that was in 1925, okay, so then um, in the wake of these cases in, in 1925, 1926, um, this area um, becomes covered with what we call petition covenants, okay, so this is where um, the White Citizens Association, and this happened all over the city, um, organized to add restrictive agreements um, along the block um, uh, you know, to, to make sure to protect um, houses that hadn't been, that didn't have covenants in their deeds when they were first sold. Okay, so they're adding, they're essentially adding covenants mm -hmm. to deeds. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this one's actually October 1925. Um, and this is just an example of one of those restrictive agreements. Um, where the neighbors are agreeing with one another that they will never convey their property um, to a black person, and they um, and then this agreement becomes legally binding uh, when it's you know filed with the recorder of deeds. Um, and I didn't include a uh, in our so if you go to our our story map legal challenges to racial covenants, um, uh, you'll find that Mount Pleasant. Um, was covered with these restrictive agreements um, over the course of just three years, um, 1927, 28, 29. Um, and all of this and um, much of um, the area kind of like the southernmost part of Petworth and Columbia Heights, a lot of petition covenants um, start to come in there in the late 20s, 1930s. Um, and in Brookland and Northeast. Uh, and all of this happened um, after a, um, as a case was moving through the courts um, called, the case is named Corrigan v. Buckley. And um, this is a case that emerged out of the DuPont Circle neighborhood um, in the, in around 1921, uh, when neighbors, white neighbors had signed one of these agreements um, but then one of those um, homeowners, I think, believe she was an absentee homeowner, decided she wanted to sell her house um, to a black couple. It's questionable whether she even knew that they were black um, uh, and the neighbors sued her. Um, and in this case, the, um, the DC courts upheld the covenant as legally binding and um, the NAACP attempted to then as they did with many of these cases to appeal, appeal them to the Supreme Court. They would get appealed within DC, the appeals court in DC would uphold them, and then they would try to get the Supreme Court to hear them. Uh, in this case, this, as the Supreme Court didn't hear the case, but it actually issued um, 
a reason for that, saying that this was a legally binding agreement between neighbors that are a contract that they that the courts in which the courts had no jurisdiction. Um, so they by sort of issuing this refusal to hear the case, they um, uh, they in essence uh, you know said sanctioned the use of these yeah, restrictive right. agreements, and then mm -hmm. you see them proliferate all over the place. Um, you know, as the case was moving through the DC courts and then, you know, once the Supreme Court uh, ruled in 1926. Um, so that's kind of a landmark case uh, in this area of restrictive covenants, Corrigan v. Buckley. Um, and that also happened in, here in DC. And not in a good way. Uh, it's a national, I mean, it's a nationally known case, you know. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. <clears throat> oh, wait, where is my. I okay, okay, so this is what that looked like. This is that 38 Randolph Street, um, the one I told you about, um, where the letter was sent. Um, and this is what the, so this is a map that then shows you, you know, the difference between the blue lots restricted by deed, all these red lots then are restricted by petition beginning in the 1920s, and then the ones that are lighter, the pink, are ones that had both. Um, right. So, boy, that area between North Capitol and First is like yeah, a hundred percent almost restricted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually an ad then that gets placed in the paper um, at this time. Um, and, and again, the Supreme advertising they're restricted. Wow. Yeah. So um, this Good appeared thing. in the Washington <laughs> Star, and. Um, you know, again, the Supreme Court didn't actually, uh, issue, you know, didn't hear the case, but they, you know, they say, we invite your attention to the decision of the US right. Supreme Court um, that Negroes cannot buy. Um, so, you know, really promoting the, the, the value of these neighborhoods, um, um, these neighborhoods being Eckington, Bloomingdale, Highview, and Edgewood. Um, and I, this I think is an interesting visual because it, it really shows you that these neighborhood names um, are very much associated. These are white. These names like are inextricable from, you know, they they define what were white neighborhoods. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so you they went away like these na these names Bloomingdale. I don't know about Eckington, uh, but the, I know growing up here. Um, it wasn't until relatively recently that that Bloomingdale name came back. Like nobody called that area, um, the, the neighborhood that we're talking about, Bloomingdale. Um, and uh, because of the and kind that of has movie. very much to do with the racial transformation yeah. of the neighborhood. Right. Bloomingdale was a white neighborhood. Right. Um, so, and then when it wasn't, when it wasn't a white neighborhood, predominantly a white neighborhood anymore, the occupants didn't really want to use that place name. Right. Um, it didn't define the, yeah, their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these neighborhoods, um, you know, have, you know, like a lot of DC neighborhoods that are now distinguished by sp very specific names like Parkview and Pleasant Plains and um, were just called Northwest, you know, mm -hmm. I, or Uptown. Um, um, so it's interesting just to think about, you know, because there's sort of an insistence of, by a lot of people now or a, a desire to like go back to these old neighborhood names and that's the real name, you know, let's call it by the real name, you, you know, but they, these names have, you know, other implications, like. Right. Yeah, right. so. Um, so we're getting a just... little short on time. <laughs> oh, shoot, we I didn't know. get that far yet. <laughs> we knew we had this landmark case in the 20s okay. that mm -hmm. upholding restrictive covenants. Yeah. Okay. But I know, because I've been on your tour, that we're going to get to a case that blows it away. Yeah, okay. So how long do we have, Carolyn? Because I... We have, about, we have about maybe seven minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I get a little bogged down um, in the details. So, okay. So this is what... Um, let me see where I am with my notes, too. Um, Okay, so as I mentioned, so nevertheless, African Americans do begin moving to these um, the southernmost blocks of Bloomingdale. Um, they sometimes can break covenants. Not all the houses had covenants um, down here, anyway. 
um, uh, and then they move to these blocks west of First Street. Um, but this, and these pins all mark um, legal cases. Um, so you can see they're sort of like creating this barrier. The courts actually sort of create this barrier by upholding covenants on the west side of First Street. Um, but just, just to show you like, just to say a little, little bit about the African-American community here and that there, there was a quite substantial um, important community that lived here, including um, that Billy Taylor family um, from the Florida Avenue Baptist Church right up here on Flagler. Um, here they are. This is Billy Taylor um, with his, uh, his cousin's can, house. I can see that. All he needs <laughs> is the big glasses. On <laughs> Flagler Place. Um, oops. Why am I? Oh, okay. Um, do, do, do. Okay. Oh, and I have some. Okay. So, right. And then as African Americans began moving out, then or as white families began moving out of these, this neighborhood, um, and especially like below Rhode Island Avenue, um, these houses actually were start being marketed to black families as early as the late twenties. Um, and so you can see in this ad here, um, um, we offer a fine brick home just vacated by a white owner. Um, this one, unusually attractive brick dwelling occupied by white owner but they're, they're you know, being marketed now to, to mm -hmm. black families. Um, here's more of those advertisements. Um, this one for right at for First and Florida Avenue. Um, this one's just below Rhode Island Avenue. Again, Rhode Island Avenue is also then continues to be a barrier um, to black settlement. Um, I just want to quickly say about this case that took case, this is the case involving only white homeowners, um, and it speaks to this racial barrier being upheld. Also, these are really beautiful houses along First Street at the corner of First and S that were um, deed covenants um, placed by Midon Shannon. Um, again, the white homeowners in these houses wanted to um, be able to, to sell to whomever they, they wanted. Um, the, however, the ones the two, their neighbors around the corner wanted to, that, that their white neighborhood maintained. Um, these ones are facing, you know, they're, they're facing west. They're facing a black neighborhood, essentially, mm -hmm. at this point. Um, these ones are in, in what remains sort of this restricted area. And they're literally around the corner. They share a backyard, though. <clears throat> Um, this is what that looked like. Okay, so the courts upheld, the courts again upheld the covenant in, the, in this case. Um, um, noting that the presence of quote colored residents in the houses along first would depreciate the value of the houses on S Street. Okay, so there, where is, do, do, do. so they're like right here, these houses. So you can see. Um, yeah. Um, because the houses had adjoining backyards. Um, and, and the covenant, you know, what the court said is that it effectively created a quote, a quote, a barrier against the eastward movement of colored, of the colored population into the restricted area um, served as a dividing line. And that's what they were meant to do. And you can see that here. Um, just again, Rhode Island Avenue also being um, uh, a racial divide here um, was home to a white, uh, congregation right at this corner there was actually that was involved in upholding restrictive covenants was eventually sold to a black congregation in 1958 um, as were most of the white oh, all but one of the white churches in this neighborhood got sold to black congregations except for one um, remained in the neighborhood um, St. Martin's so then, Catholic yeah, so Church. The, so the neighborhood then is starting to transform so then why do we end up needing a case that goes to the Supreme Court? Well, this is, yeah, okay, because we're talking about still like it's moving up. So um, there's, there, the, there's still barriers to black settlement, especially on those Easter, you know, the, those blocks between First and, and North Capitol. Um, so this is more of the sort of the black community that was living, um, living in Bloomingdale, but not, you know, not on certain blocks, okay? Mm -hmm. So living, um, 
either on the west side of First Street or on those blocks between First and Second. The Barnett Aiden Gallery, a black gallery founded in 1943, again, on the 100 block of Randolph, southernmost part of the neighborhood. Um, this is a map created by Charles Hamilton Houston, who um, is uh, integral Fair to the man. story of, the, of this case Senate. that went to the Supreme yeah. Court. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, Fair man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Houston, um, he's an attorney out of Howard University. He had um, gone, moved to New York to lead up the NAACP's National Civil Rights Program, come back to DC and started litigating racial covenant cases in 1941, starting in Columbia Heights, um, then in Bloomingdale. He made this map um, when he started litigating cases um, here in Bloomingdale um, to show, uh, you know, what was going on here. So then he's the attorney who ends up working with a family whose case becomes the case, right? Right. Yeah. So he um, he starts litigating cases in this in his northernmost blocks, talking about how covenants actually by this time are depreciating property values um, because white people don't want to live here anymore, black people can't buy the houses, they're literally sitting vacant, um, they're being rented. Um, that's one of the photographs he submitted. Um, this is a comparison of housing values he submitted. Mm -hmm. um, I can go back to it if anyone's interested. This is that house that had a covenant being sold at auction. An African-American person had tried to buy this house as early as the 1920s, and now it's being auctioned off in 1941. Um, it was probably rented during that period. Um, I'll skip the Mays v. Burgess case, um, but, but the, I'll say the dissenting judge in this case, covenants were upheld again in this case, but a dissenting judge actually recognized the context of the situation of the severe housing shortage that, um, that black residents were facing, especially during World War II, um, and the fact that the neighborhood itself was now, was. Um, a lot of black people were living in the neighborhood, especially right on the other side of First Street, um, right here. Um, and in fact, in this companion case, just a, block, a couple blocks down from um, Mays, um, this house was on the other side of the street. The covenant didn't get upheld, literally because it's on the other side of the street, okay, no. in a black neighborhood. Um, so Houston starts litigating um, the cases up here, um, and specific, and then he loses them. He lo the covenants are all upheld on Adams Street here, um, but then he goes up to, to one sixteen Bryant Street, where a house um, where his client um, had purchased a house from a real estate broker that, that Houston was partnering with um, in this in this project of breaking covenants. Um, and um, so that, that couple, James and Mary Hurd, purchased 116 Bryant Street uh, in 1941. Um, the neighbors sued them um, to uphold covenants. The house did have a covenant. Um, Houston um, takes the case through the district courts, which uphold the covenant. Um, but at this time, finally, the Supreme Court is um, going to hear a, another racial covenant, a couple other racial covenant cases out of St. Louis and, and Detroit. Um, and a DC case um, needs to serve as a companion because indeed those cases are going to be heard on the basis of the 14th Amendment, which doesn't necessarily apply um, to DC residents because it applies to the citizens of states. Um, uh, so when, a, when you have a big civil rights case going to the Supreme Court, um, it's important that a DC case goes because it's going to be argued on a different basis. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it was argued on the basis of something called the Civil Rights Act of 1866, um, which requires the federal government to treat its citizens equally. Um, so finally, um, in this case, uh, the Supreme Court um, deems that covenants can no longer be enforced by the courts, um, that, there aren't, that, that the enforcement of covenants is unconstitutional. Um, and this and so, has national yeah. implications. Yeah, yeah. And so the nat so nationally, this case is more well known as Shelley v. Kramer, um, the the case that came out of St. Louis. But Heard v. Hodge is you know there's it involves Shelley v. Kramer is a group of cases, um, three cases, and and one of them is is Heard v. Hodge, um, which um, and there if you go to 116 Bryant Street, you'll see um, 
a heritage trail sign right across the street um, that talks about this case. Um, yeah. Excellent. All right, hold tight a second, because mm -hmm. I want to, folks may have to drop off, but I want to make okay. sure we get some questions in. Um, let's see here. Oh, are the petitions, this is getting back to the beginning, are the petitions for the compensated emancipation um, in the DC archives? Or this person may mean, are they in the um, National Archives? Yeah, they are, but they're also available online. Um, and I think that probably the easiest way to access them is a site, a website called Civil War Washington. Um, and they've actually, Civil War Washington actually transcribed them all. Um, so you don't even have to read the handwriting if you don't want to. Yeah. The first occupants, or what, do we know what the occupations were of the first residents of Bloomingdale? Um, they were arranged, I mean, like a lot of the people worked for the government, um, of course, it's being DC, um, but there were, it's like, uh, they sort of represented a wide range of sort of both uh, white collar and, and some sort of more blue collar kind of occupations. Um, I can't remember specifically, but, um, you know, and then you've got lawyers and but a lot of like government clerks and, and um, yeah, I can speak yeah. more about the black residents than I can the white residents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The real estate values here in the early 1900s with the neighborhoods getting developed, um, they would have been pretty good. Uh, they may, if we compare it, say, to Bloomingdale today, the home values might not have been as high, relatively as high as they are right. today. Right, that's right, yeah. Right, so it, it wasn't required that you be wealthy to live in Bloomingdale. It was very kind of um, middle, like, yeah, middle class in the old sense of middle class, but middle class is like everything now. So I, I don't know. Right. But I mean, it's, but now I wouldn't but now really the housing call, in Bloomingdale. I would, yeah, Bloomingdale to me now is quite a wealthy neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Um, although it's I think a lot of people that live there would say I'm middle class. But, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> this is a, I like this one. Um, tell a little bit about the border wall um, around LaDroit Park. It's eventually knocked down, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, that border, that wall was always contested. So, like, it wasn't. It was always being vandalized and broken down. And that, that wood, that solid wood fence and back um, would, um, you know, holes would be punched in it. Pieces of it would be taken down, and then it would be put back up. Um, uh, ultimately, a white real estate developer bought land north of that fence um, and also then also put pressure on the city. Um, then the city sort of, as it is now and as it was then, is much more <laughs> um, uh, responsive to pressure by the real estate community. <laughs> um, and so um, the uh, Ultimately, the city issued an ultimatum to the 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 private, you know, owners of Ledroit Park that they weren't going to provide city services uh, in Ledroit Park if that fence didn't come if down. If that fence so, didn't go yeah, away. it came down in 1891. Okay. Yeah. So you've got this great slide here at the end. Um, if people want to pursue um, their curiosity about this chapter in DC history one place is dcpolicycenter.org and then um our website your website yeah. that is segregation dc yeah 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 what in your um in the aftermath of this what are the implications for washington dc and the aftermath of of the case that charles hamilton houston brings to the supreme court Oh, well, um, okay, so African Americans have been like largely confined to living in and getting increasingly crowded as the population um, grew uh, into a very small section of the city. You can see this very clearly on our maps. Um, um, so they were able to then claim a lot more space in the city. Um, 
uh, after, and that happens, you can see that by 1960, um, uh, that you've got uh, black people living in, in neighborhoods, you know, all over the city, mo most of the city east of the, east of Rock Creek Park, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, the city actually remains profoundly segregated, um, you know, with the, the barrier of Rock Creek Park. Um, and, um, and then also you've got, continue to have then like almost 100% black population east of the Anacostia River. Um, whereas some of the other neighborhoods in between those two places might be a little bit more mixed, but, um, uh, you know, so you've got, you know, black people gain a lot more access to, um, to good housing, you know, to newer housing um, outside, you know, far away, you know, further away from the, from the downtown core. Um, um, I mean, there's, I, I don't want, I, it could go, you know, there's, um, because of this, this association of, of the, the value of property um, with race that, that is made by covenants, um, you've got, you know, that has implications for them, this racial trans, the, the white people then move, moving out of the city um, as, as black people move into what had been, you know, white restricted neighborhoods. Um, so, um, so I should, I mean, the city remains quite segregated. Blacks have access to a lot more housing. Um, but a lot of people have been shut out of the real estate market for so long by that time that they don't necessarily, you know, they don't necessarily become home homeowners. Mm -hmm. Right away. Um, yep. Nor yep. do they necessarily gain as much equity in their homes um, as, um, as they might um, due, to the, due to the legacy of the association of the value of property and, and race, right. I should say. Um, and, uh, yeah. Were there, Sarah, were there uh, restricted covenants east of the river in Southeast DC? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were definitely um, uh, white only subdivisions that were developed east of the river. Yeah. And we have those are we have some of those mapped as well. On your you website. You can see on our website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing this information and these resources with us. Thank you. Thank Thanks for everybody who hung in there. <laughs> and um, next week, folks, we will have, if you're still with us, next week in this time slot, we're going to have Josh Gibson, who is a longtime Adams Morgan resident, author of the book Adams Morgan Then and Now. And if you follow DC government um, politics, particularly their communication via Twitter, Josh is the voice of the DC Council. So he's going to come next week and talk with us about his neighborhood, Adams Morgan. Hope you can join us. Sarah, thank you again. Um, we'll see y'all next week. Bye-bye.